Illegal logging is laying waste to Sierra Leone's endangered forests. Despite years of laws and bans, its precious timber is still being exported abroad. So why can't the authorities do more to stop it? And why did the vice president's men ask for a massive bribe? How much do you think he's well, allowing me? If you throw in 50,000 first, it will be fine. In this edition of Africa Investigates, reporter Soria Samora exposes the high-level corruption that's stripping his country bare. Years of civil war during the 90s devastated Sierra Leone's environment as rebels exploited natural resources to fund their violent campaign. But even now, in peacetime, the country's forests are at risk of being completely wiped out. I'm back in my home country, Sierra Leone, to investigate illegal timber logging, a trade that is destroying whatever little forest this country has left. I'm told the corrupt practice goes way to the highest level of government. Experts calculate that logging is a multi-million dollar business here. A 2006 EU report identified logging as the leading cause of environmental degradation in Sierra Leone. And according to the Forestry Ministry, unless immediate action is taken, all the country's forests, as well as the endangered species they support, could disappear by 2018. It's the end of the rainy season, and the landscape looks green enough. But these are mainly shrubs and grasses, not mature trees. In the dry season, deforested areas frequently degrade into wasteland. The president of Sierra Leone, Ernest Baikoroma, has publicly sworn to fight corruption and protect our country's remaining forest. He has personally assured me that he will take action if our investigation exposes wrongdoing. The investigation will require two teams. Anas, a journalist from Ghana who is keeping his identity hidden, and Bilal, his colleague from Jordan, will go deep undercover with secret cameras. They will pose as international timber exporters in order to draw out the politicians involved in this murky business. Something I am unable to do since I'm too well known to the MPs here. I don't want to be seen with them until their sting operation is over in a few days' time. In the meantime, I'll follow my own leads. I've found it's not easy to get people to talk on camera about what's going on here, either because they are corrupt themselves or because they are afraid of what might happen to them if they do speak to me. The risk for me is having to rely on people who may sell me out. Kate Garnett, Deputy Director of the Forestry Ministry, is willing to stick out her neck, however. And I think I can trust her. As this film involves undercover work, we agree to meet away from the government buildings. Hi, good morning, Kate. Good morning, sir. Morning. Thank you so much for meeting me. So, Kate, can you tell me, is there any legally registered company now in the country, operating in the country? No, for this year, no. So, are you telling me that all the people who are logging timber, who are chopping off timber in this country, they are logging illegally? Yes. Anybody logging now, it's illegal. If something is not done urgently, what do you think is going to happen to this country? If actions are not taken immediately to stop the deforestation that we have now, because for now, 90% of our forest, you know, we've lost. So if something is not done immediately, there will be disaster in this country. We have the erratic rainfall, you know, flooding. So we need to take um, immediate action to stop the alarming rate of deforestation happening right now. According to Kate, the president has been supporting the forestry department's efforts to stop the logging companies. But those efforts have had only limited success. Over the past three years, the government has tried several times to outlaw timber exports. But due to the lobbying power of the industry and their political backers, these bans have only ever been temporary. It's confusing. 
Right now, for example, there is supposed to be another ban in place, and this time it's supposed to be permanent. Yet from a source at Sierra Leone's main port, I've learned that the ban is yet again about to be. on the mind my inside man at the key just showed me this letter lifting the ban on timber exports and it's coming directly from the president's chief of staff's office i i'm not sure what's going on here i wonder if the president is aware of this if he endorses it or if there is some game being played behind his back <laughs> Later, I find out that the official reason for temporarily postponing the ban is only to allow the export of timber that has already been caught. Once it has all been sold, the permanent ban will then come into effect. It's meant to be a very brief respite as existing stocks of timber are officially very small. But in practice, I'm told that loggers just cut down new trees and pass them off as old stock, allowing them to continue getting around the law. I want to head up country to see for myself if trees are still being cut down. It's happening all over Sierra Leone. But first, I'm going to take the five-hour drive east to Masimbi, where I've arranged to meet Abdul Sina, a community leader who is angry at the damage that has been done there. When I got there, I found a graveyard of timber. The loggers had moved on to another area, leaving behind the logs they didn't want, and the locals were busy salvaging what they could for themselves. Mr. Sina, what would you say is the impact of this high level of deforestation and, and timber exporting? If things continue at this rate, what do you think is going to happen to Sierra Leone's forests? We're going to lose all our forests uh, that help us to protect us against adverse weather conditions. And then uh, we'll be expecting things like drought, less agricultural products, and so forth. Do you think people will stop this um, illegal logging and illegal timber smuggling? Will it stop here in Sierra Leone? It will stop, provided if the authorities are sincere to it. If the authorities are sincere to it, then it will stop. But if they are not sincere, it, it cannot be... Uh, well, how hopeful are you? I don't, I, don't, I don't have any hope about it. So as long as you have influence with the government, then you can come along and do your, your timber log, you know, timber process that you want to undertake. I wanted to hear what the locals thought about the situation. Good morning, morning, morning. I don't know, do. Other people in there will not feel fine like you. We no say yes, they're poorly for us. They're no saying I'm poorly for us. I'm not going to. I'm not going to. Because I'm not happy, I'm not going to. I don't benefit I'm glad you yeah. I don't know benefit for me. No glad for me. To me, I don't feel good anyway because look where the grass don't take over the place. You see? So with the time it will, it will be a problem for me. And for the picking them. It will give big big problem. Mm. We and the, the one who will, will, will not burn it. Mm. You see? Mm. These people, I mean, some of them are not happy. Some of them thought only about the short-term benefit, you know, those who were getting money, those who were being paid. But um, the vast majority weren't happy, and they said there are lots of logs because these people left in a hurry. But hey, I'll let them get on with work. Good luck, sir. Thank you. And Thank that's you. Okay. Sir. The next leg of my trip is Bendembu, 160 miles north of Freetown, where I hope to find the illegal loggers themselves. As a journalist, I really want to confront these loggers if I find them, but um, I've been warned that these guys are really ruthless. You know, they've tied people up, beating people, attacking them with machetes. So I think the best bet will be to just pose as a businessman and try to get underneath the skin of all what's going on here.
just stopped the car because I can hear some sawing. So uh, I'm going to jump out of the car now and see if we can investigate. I can hear both sides of the bush. I can hear one going off here and there as well. That's right. Looks like it's deep in the bush. Minutes of talk. If you want five, six, seven hundred, if you want the like getting trailer, yes, we will get. Where are you get? Where are you get her? I direct you all the side back after on a commander back. The other back on a goodie. Okay. Alright. But we do. Then go, I mean, fresh, fresh one now. Now we want. Not a problem now. It's a problem. But we'll find out talk first to Chief. You know, say that kind of thing, yeah? Yeah, for sure, uh, respect to yeah, the yeah, yeah, Chief. Yeah. But then, um, I yes, think... Yes, we are not to Chief. We are going to Okay. Okay. Going to Chief Wimbe, we are going to Chief Wimbe, we are going to Chief Wimbe, we are going to Chief Wimbe. Okay. This is really hard to take in. This guy tells me that he cuts up to 30 trees a day and, you know, he sells them to anyone who can pay the price. But I just have a feeling there's a lot more going on around here and I'm going to keep searching. While we were filming by the roadside, a truck passed us with its cargo covered by tarpaulin. But this was obviously timber on its way to the coast. The owners of the timber approached us and we continued filming, telling them we wanted to record our business trip. So now they're able to do better business. People, and if you cut that, because we cut them, we say, if you don't forget people who want them. But in, in, order, in order to affect uh, the, in order to affect the environment, when yeah. they cut all into here. The trader told me he had over 500 logs lying in the bush. But that if I wanted to deal in larger quantities, I would have to find the paramount chief. Even if I wanted to buy from someone else, I'd have to run it by the chief first, as he controls the region. Now it's time to look for this chief and see if we can do business. Some local people take us to where the chief and his crew are busy cutting down trees, particularly the valuable Benny tree that's much in demand in China. I tell him we are businessmen who are already in the timber trade elsewhere in West Africa. I'm Abdul. I'm the fourth gentleman in this timber, and I think I have the last name. I have to say yes or no to whoever works here. Very lucky. So I am the, yeah, I'm the paramount chief hmm. for this particular chief. Hmm. Won't we have problem with no, any no, politician? No, 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 no. For this business, mm. no interference. Mm. I do my own business with my customer. Nobody interferes. In as long as you do your own business, mm. the government there you. It struck me that the chief seemed remarkably unconcerned about whether a timber export ban was in place or not. Nothing appeared to impact on his business. How long have you been doing this? Uh, we started the last time when the government stopped it. Okay. So we started we... when the government stopped it. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> well, we're happy as long as it's done or no ban, we get our business. Mm -hmm. That's fine. Mm -hmm. So the ban will not stop us, thank God. <laughs> Am I right? We'll be fine. Yeah, yeah. No Nobody will stop you. Nobody. This chief is supposed to be the custodian of these forests. Traditionally, we used to refer to our forests as sacred, but instead, he's destroying them. 
What I've seen on this trip is not only clear-cut evidence of illegal logging, but a worrying sign that Sierra Leoneans have not learned the lessons of the past. Before, it was the exploitation of diamonds that led to conflict. This time, could it be timber? Much of the smuggling takes place over porous borders into neighboring Guinea or Liberia. But the main action is blatantly out in the open with the knowledge of corrupt officials. Freetown Sport is the largest natural harbor in Africa, and this is where thousands of tons of illegal timber are shipped out each year. I need to investigate for myself with the help of my contact at the key. Well, I'm here now to uh, meet my man who's actually helping me to make things happen. I mean, we're just, we're nearly there. Uh, I'm, I'm a bit concerned because the security here is a little bit tight. And if we're caught, you know, that will be some serious problem. The, the truth about operations like this, you just don't know who to trust. This is it. My inside man proves to be trustworthy, and what he has to show amazes me. Security looks tight and there's no way container loads of timber should be able to bypass it. But he shows me how easy it is when there are enough corrupt port officials willing to look the other way. Every vehicle is supposed to go through the scanner, after which it is tagged with a painted yellow mark. But officials regularly tag the vehicles in advance in order to avoid the scanner. The port top brass can then do their best to make sure there are no spot checks on certain vehicles. In a situation like this, an honest man like my contact is considered a spanner in the works. Meanwhile, our undercover team are also making progress. Anas and Bilal have been posing as timber traders, trying to set up an export business despite the government's official stand against wood being taken out of the country. Incredibly, they've been told that the best way of doing this discreetly is via the office of Sierra Leone's vice president, Samuel Samsumana. It's clearly very important to find out if he's personally aware of this or is involved in any questionable practices or double dealing. But before they can see him, they are told they have to pay a $2,000 registration fee and they also have to go through several meetings with two of his closest aides. You touch the right button. Okay. Well, between Mama and myself, mm. Right, but if you can't meet. Okay. Still, we are very popular, we are very known in this country. Nice. Anywhere we take you, you get a protection. Yeah. Look at you, you are in the vice president's office. While Anas and Bilal inch closer to the vice president, I arrange a business lunch with the paramount chief while he's in Freetown. As far as he's concerned, I'm still a timber exporter wanting to do business. He tells me he's connected with everyone needed to export timber, from corrupt port officials to ministers who are prepared to bend the rules. <laughs> so why not be flexible mm. to get money, raise money, because the money people are getting is fabulous. I'm unable to pursue this lead to the top as the chief's high-powered connections will recognize me straight away. At this point in the investigation, I have to take a back seat while Anas and Bilal finally get to go ahead from one of the aides to meet the vice president in person. to you as a bigger father to give us the blessings in the business. 
uh, uh, ban or no ban, <laughs> we hope to be able to do no, proper. No, it's been okay, okay, okay. Despite the fact that no login company has been registered in Sierra Leone this year and that a permanent export ban is due to start the following day, the VP seems happy to help us set up a major long-term business that would almost certainly cause significant damage to the environment. He tells us the ban will be postponed again. But only the president has the power to do this. To me, the very fact that he is even meeting with timber exporters sends the message that Sierra Leone is for sale. Later that night, the VP's close advisor, the man who had introduced our team to the VP, Alex Mansari, wasted no time in telling them what was expected of them, in dollars, in return for the VP's political influence. We have no way of verifying if they were acting on their boss's behalf as they claimed, or for themselves. But the bribes they wanted were clearly intended to secure very high level official support. How much do you think he's well, like the VP, if you throw in 50,000 first, it will be fine. Okay. Mm -hmm. so okay. Like that, you know. okay. Okay. We do VP 15,000 and 50,000. 50, and uh, what about the forestry guy? We split 20, 30 amounts. I mean, look at the budget of 100,000. Okay. Oh, that's fine. Yes, that's, that's fine. It. Who will talk to the VP for us on that? I can. Okay. But those type of things, you have to come with the money and give them. Okay. And you have to come with the money. Like, give us a gift, come with the money, you say, thank you for the last time. Okay. Sure. If you don't have cash, you don't talk. Yeah. Money that's talks true. in Africa. That's true. Within 24 hours, our undercover businessmen are completing the paperwork for their login company. Setting up any business in Sierra Leone normally takes many weeks, even with bribes, and to register so quickly takes considerable political clout. More to the point, today is the first day of the permanent ban on timber exports, so this company should not even be able to function legally. I'm disappointed to find the registration takes place at the Forestry Ministry, a ministry that until now I had thought was united against the environmental damage that logging brings. Because now the country is open for business. One of the vice president's close advisors informs our team that the VP has already put the wheels in motion for our business, with the advisor on the board as one of the major shareholders. So now you've got the whole yeah, picture. Um, yes. Because they called, they called up, reported to BP mm -hmm. about the meeting. Okay. They are coming with more documents. So you have to sign more documents. The vice president's men are keen to get things going immediately, which means they want money quickly. So it's time for me and my team to leave the country. It's obvious to me that in Sierra Leone, there are many powerful people who are willing to put their personal ambitions over the needs of their nation. Unless we can put an end to this corruption now, Sierra Leone will lose its remaining forest forever, and this could lead to poverty and conflict in the future. I just hope that one day, the ordinary people in my country will be able to benefit from our natural resources instead of being caused by them. We wrote to Vice President Sumana to ask about his relationship with Alex Mansare and Momo Conte. Could he explain why Alex Mansare had told our undercover reporters that the Vice President's support for a login venture could be obtained in return for $50,000? Had the Vice President ever received payments from the two men in return for lending his support to our login enterprise or any other venture? In his response, the Vice President told us that while he did know Mansare and Conte, neither men worked for the government and their claims to be his advisor and campaign manager were false. He told us that Alex was acting solely on his own accord without any prior discussion with me. He denied having 
ever received any money from any quarter solicited by either Alex or Momo Conte on my behalf. He said he had no knowledge of the registration of a timber company and that he had not been happy to help set one up. He said he had offered to speak to the Ministry of Agriculture on their behalf because it handled all matters relating to forestry. His letter did not explain how two of his friends came to be using his office to secure bribes. But he did say it was untrue to suggest that his office's support for illegal activity could be secured for cash.